الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم أنه فانتهوا الله سبحانه وتعالى منشن in a very well known verse on the Quran that what take whatever the messenger of Allah has given to you and stay away from whatever the messenger of Allah prohibits you from or told you to stay away from okay bismillah today i want to discuss in the light of this verse and many other verses of the quran the authority and the correct meaning of sunnah that of course we know that the sunnah is a source of the sharia for us okay and unfortunately there are many misunderstandings today regarding the sunnah and these misunderstandings are in various forms the most extreme misunderstanding regarding this subject is on the level of kufr or disbelief when some people reject the sunnah altogether so there are some people even they exist in india called ahli quran the people who only follow the quran they say we reject the sunnah we do not follow the sunnah they are kuffar okay one of those people in the world today is for example the leader of libya gaddafi he has openly said i only follow the quran we reject the sunnah the sunnah is not authentic i reject it we do not follow the sunnah even though many people and dawa carriers went to him and tried to discuss with him and he had many of them killed right he rejected the sunnah openly and many dawa carriers wrote many books against him in the muslim world so first issue we need to understand is that the sunnah is definitively in a qat'i way we must understand in a definite way it is a source of revelation for us allah azza wa jalla has said in so many verses regarding is not only the verse i quoted he said may yatir rasulu faqad ata allah you who obeys the messenger has obeyed allah ya ayyuhal ladina amanu atiu allah wa atiu rasul oh you believe obey allah and his messenger وَمَا يَنْتِكُ أَنِ الْهَوَا إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٍ يُوهَا Nor does he speak from his own desire. He only speaks what, he, what is inspired to him or what is revealed to him. So Allah Azza wa Jal in the Qur'an itself, anybody who believes in the Qur'an has to believe in the Sunnah. Because the belief in the Qur'an means that you follow the meanings in the Qur'an. And to reject the Sunnah is a rejection of the Qur'an. Because it is a rejection of all those ayahs. which establish the authority of the sunnah that we must take the sunnah as a source of guidance just as we take the quran both of them are the sources of guidance for us and revelation so we have to first understand this point that the sunnah definitely is a source of sharia now most of us of course accept that okay only the people who have totally deviated away from islam and gone into disbelief they have a problem with that but most of the muslims of course they understand that in a clear way however there are still some misunderstanding in the minds of the muslims regarding the issue of sunnah one of those is that the quran is the primary source and the sunnah is secondary to that totally meaning they relegate its authority and they see that the quran is only important the sunnah is like somehow they view in their mind it is less authentic or it is not there we should not look at it that is also a misunderstanding okay that yes the quran of course it has been compiled in a definitive way it is known as mutawatir okay in a way which is impossible for there to be an error in that but similarly in the sunnah they are the mutawatir narrations those narrations which are mutawatir like the the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said that whosoever invents something and claims that i have said it okay and it is not true he will be in the fire this hadith is mutawatir it is reported by multiple lines of transmission that is impossible for there to be an error in that just as the quran was compiled in the same way okay and you have in the sunnah other hadith which may not be mutawatir but they are classified as sahih as sound okay and hasan as acceptable so the sunnah yes in its method of compilation okay they are some variances to the quran but still its authority is there and we must look to it as a source of revelation now this is from the point of view of authenticity then there is another perspective there today are many confusions upon the meaning of the sunnah 
Okay? And some people think that the fard comes from the Quran and any other hukum come, may come from the sunnah. That is not true. Okay? Or that the haram and the halal or is mentioned in the Quran and other details are mentioned in the sunnah. That is not true. Okay? From the Quran and the sunnah we get the different ahkam. Whether that is fard, obligation, that meaning what? Obligation means if you do it, you get reward. If you stay away from it, you are sinful. Like the obligatory salah, like the obligatory fasting and hajj and zakah and ruling by whatever Allah has revealed. Obedience to the parents in those areas where you are obliged to obey and so on. These are the fara'id, the obligations. Okay? And the muharramat, the prohibitions are those actions where if you do it, you are sinful. If you leave it, you are rewarded. Okay? Like eating pork, drinking alcohol, committing zina or the actions that lead towards zina. Okay, engaging in riba, okay, supporting uh, those who are enemies of Islam and attack other Muslims to fight another Muslim brother without a just reason, reason from the Sharia, etc. These are the muharramat, the prohibitions. Then we have what is known as the nafila or mustahab or mandub or sometimes also people call it sunnah here. And this is why there is a confusion. What is known as the recommended deeds. Those deeds that if you do it, you get rewards. If you don't do it, there is no sin. Okay? Like the recommended prayers. Salat al-Tahajjud, Ishra, and the other recommended prayers. These are examples of recommendation. The different du'as that we recite when we go into the toilet, when we come out of the toilet, when we wake up, when we go to sleep. These are recommended. We do it, we get rewards. If we don't do it, we are not sinful. So this is known as mandub. Now, there is a confusion here. We have to understand the term sunnah linguistically. The term sunnah, it means the path or the way. Okay? So that is why sometimes they may say, the sunnah of Allah is this. Some people use this term. Linguistically is the meaning. The sunnah meaning the way of Allah. The way that Allah has established order in the universe. Okay? Sometimes people use this term. The sunnah linguistically means that. However, when it comes to a juristic term, when it comes to the sciences of the Sharia, the Sunnah is used in different contexts by different type of ulama in different disciplines. So let us understand its meaning, then we will clarify it here further. To the ulama of hadith, to the scholars of hadith, meaning the ones like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Tirmidhi, okay, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the ulama of hadith who compile the narration, the term sunnah, they sometimes use it to mean hadith, to mean narration from the Prophet ﷺ, or about the action or the consent of the Prophet ﷺ. So, in when we look and if we are reading a book about hadith, they will use, they will say, this is found in the sunnah. This means it is found in the hadith. That is the terminology they are using there. To the ulama of fiqh, to the ulama of jurisprudence. Jurisprudence means what? Meaning the law. Okay, the ulama who compile the law, meaning like Abu Hanifa, Ashafi, okay, the other scholars, Ibn Hazm, etc., who wrote volumes and volumes of fiqh, meaning jurisprudence, these are the laws of the Sharia. Sunnah, when they use the terminology sunnah, it means recommended. So if they say the two sunnah prayers before Fajr, it means the two recommended prayers. Okay? Or if they say uh, the fast on Monday and Thursday is sunnah, it means it is recommended. Okay? Mandub, which means recommended, or mustahab, which means the same thing, or nafila, which means a similar thing. Sometimes all of these are used with the same context. Okay? Now, to the ulama of usulul fiqh, to the ulama of the foundations of jurisprudence, not to jurisprudence itself, to the foundations, meaning to the principles of how to understand the Sharia. Okay? What is known as usul al fiqh. Usul meaning the principles or the foundation, and fiqh meaning jurisprudence. Okay? So the scholars who wrote, and many of the scholars in history wrote about this subject, and even when we look at this subject, for example, if you want to understand the types of evidences in Islam, we look to the books of Usul al-Fiqh, like al-Risala of Shafi'i, 
Okay, like Al-Ihkam fi usul Al-Ihkam of Amidi, like Al-Mustasfa of Ghazali, okay, like Irshad Al-Fuhul of Shawkani. These are the books of usul of fiqh the principles of jurisprudence, how to understand the law, basically. How do you understand the evidences, how do you outweigh the evidences, etc. When it is in reference to this, Sunnah means the source of Sharia. When they say, this is from the Sunnah, it means they look at Sunnah as a source of Sharia and they talk about, when we look at the Sunnah, let us study it in, from the point of view of the source of the Ahkam. Okay? So, sometimes we may get mixed up and confused by these different ways that the term Sunnah is used. So we have to understand the term Sunnah in the correct context with the correct meaning. Okay? Now, when we want to understand the Sunnah and the most misunderstanding today is regarding the Ahkam Sharia. This is the subject that I will go into in more detail. Some people have weird understandings, strange understandings regarding the Sunnah as a source of Sharia. And they have a total confusion in this subject. For example, one brother recently in Delhi, it is a, it is a strange example but it is true. Somebody came to his house and he offered them tea. He said, do you want some tea? And the brother said, no, it is haram, I cannot drink it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ did not drink tea. Okay, so this is an extreme understanding which is a misunderstanding totally of the Sunnah. Okay, other people, they will say, look, why are you, how can you be talking about Islam? You are not dressed as the Prophet ﷺ was dressed. So they include the dress of the Prophet ﷺ as Sunnah from the point of view of not Sunnah in the sense of permissibility because Sunnah can mean permissibility, we will go into that. Okay? Sunnah they say from the point of view of recommended or sometimes even obligatory. Okay? Some people they have a problem, I have read the books where they say, oh today look, we are in the modern world, we should reject the technology because it is not from the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ did not drive a car. He did not get on a plane, he did not go on a train, he did not use a computer, he did not use a mobile phone. Therefore we should reject it because it is not from the Sunnah. So we must understand there is huge confusion and how do we clarify this? How do we understand it in a proper way? Let us discuss this. Okay? Let us understand that we are worried today about the subject of the Sunnah from the point of view of Usul al from the point of view as a source for the Ahkam Sharia. Let me say a statement to you. You may become confused at first about that, but then I will clarify. Some people, they think we should follow everything that the Prophet ﷺ did. That is not true. The Prophet ﷺ did things and actions that if we were to do, we would commit haram. So the Sunnah as a source of Sharia can be haram. It can be far obligation. It can be recommended. It can be permissible. It depends on what is the hukum, i.e. what is the rule of Allah. Just because the Prophet did it doesn't mean automatically that there is a rule. We have to look for the rule. And that is what the scholars of jurisprudence do. They look for the rule. So let me give you an example. The Prophet ﷺ married more than four wives. For us it is prohibited. The Prophet ﷺ used to fast and never break his fast for three days. He used to fast after Maghrib without breaking it. This is haram for us. The Prophet ﷺ in his marriage, mahar was not obligatory. To give the mahar the amount from the man was not part for the Prophet. Okay? So, the Prophet ﷺ, certain things are specific to him. Meaning not, we should not look automatically. The Prophet ﷺ did something automatically, it means for us it is part or recommended. We have to look what is the hukam. What is the rule from that? Okay? The Prophet ﷺ may have done things which are permitted only. Not obligatory, not recommended. So let us look. So let us understand the types of sunnah first. Okay? Then this picture will become clearer. They are, the scholars have defined three categories when it comes to the sunnah as a source of sharia. Okay? One is holy, the speech. The qawl of the Prophet ﷺ. One is fi'li, the action 
of the Prophet Sallallahu and the third is Takrili, the silence, the Takrili, the silence of the Prophet Sallallahu Meaning what? When we look at a Sunnah from the point of view as a source of law, we look to the speech of the Prophet, the silence of the Prophet, and the actions of the Prophet. All of them are part of the Sunnah, meaning we can gain an understanding of the revelation from those. Okay, so let us look. For example, the Prophet said, Inna man a'mal bin niya. Very actions of our intention. So this is from the qawli, from the speech of the Prophet Okay? The Prophet when we look at his fi'l, his actions, the way he performed hajj, we gain from that. Okay? The way we, he performed salah, we get from his actions. Okay? Not only his sayings, you know the talseeb of salah, the ordering, that you do the qiyam, the rukud, and the sujood. This ordering of the salah is from the actions of the Prophet not from his sayings. There is no hadith which specifies the tartib, the ordering of prayer exactly. There are hadith which talk about individual parts, like the sujood and like different things, the ruku. But they don't discuss the whole thing. That is from the action. There is no hadith meaning in terms of the speech of the Prophet. Okay? From his actions they are. So we must understand from these three, from the speech, from the action, and the silence. For example, the Prophet Sallam approved of women praying in the masjid but at the back of the masjid. This is his silence, his consent towards that action. So it is from the sunnah as a source. Okay? So from when we look at the things, the actions and the silence of the Prophet ﷺ, we can extract or the scholars will extract the hukam, the sharia rule that we should follow. Whether it is first, for example, like salah, the way the Prophet ﷺ used to pray. It may be Something which is haram, like the Prophet ﷺ said to fast on the day of Eid or the, the two times of Eid, Fitr and Adha is haram. This is from the Sunnah, it is not from the Quran. It is from the Sunnah in terms of the holy part, the speech of the Prophet. ﷺ. Or it can be from the Mandub, the recommended, like fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. Okay? Or it can be makruh. Makruh means that if you do it, you are not sinful. If you stay away from it, you are rewarded. It means it is this life. So like the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about not eating garlic when you go to the masjid. Okay? It is known as makruh, meaning detestable or dis- disliked. That if you do it, you are not sinful. If you do it, but if you stay away from it, it's better, meaning you will get reward. Okay? Or it could be mubah, permissible. Permissible means what? It means if you do it, there is no sin and there is no reward. Okay? So, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, it is narrated that he drank water while standing, meaning it is permissible. It is not haram. Okay? So, we must understand the Prophet ﷺ rode on a camel, so that is permissible by definition. Okay? We cannot say just because the Prophet ﷺ rode on a camel, we must ride on a camel. You must have an evidence to say that riding on a camel is more than permissible. And there is no evidence. So therefore it is simply permitted. To say that it is recommended, you need a dalil. You need an evidence that the Prophet said, yes, this is recommended. If you do it, you will get reward. Or if you, if you don't do it, you will be sinful. Something like that to, to specify that is firm. But if we don't have that, the minimum is that it is permissible. Okay? So now... How do we understand the actions of the Prophet ﷺ? And this is the area where people a lot of times have confusion. Because the speech of the Prophet ﷺ normally is explicit. The Prophet ﷺ will say about something. So for example, if the Prophet ﷺ said, Tibab al-Muslim fusuk wa kitaluhum kufr. To accuse a Muslim is a transgression. And to fight him is disbelief. So if the Prophet ﷺ said that, that is quite explicit. That to fight a Muslim is haram and to accuse a Muslim is haram. Because he has associated sin with both of them. He has said it is fusuk, which means transgression, and it is kufr, which means disbelief, which is even worse. So, those both of those things are prohibited. So, this is from the speech of the Prophet. ﷺ. Normally, from the speech of the Prophet, ﷺ, people can see it explicitly, in explicit terms, when he said, dua is mukhal ibadah, it is the uh, brain of worship. So, we can see the Prophet ﷺ has praised dua to a high degree. So, it is a recommended thing. Okay? So, 
the speech of the Prophet ﷺ is one thing. Now, how do we understand the actions of the Prophet ﷺ? This is where people become confused, where there is no explicit statement. The Prophet ﷺ did not say, wear the same clothes that I wear. He did not say that. That is why people become confused now. Because if he had said it or not, if he had said it, then it would have been a clear matter. That wear the same clothes I wear, fine, we will wear it. Okay? But, he did not say. They say from his actions, he wore it, therefore we should wear it. Okay? This is where it leads to a confusion. We must understand. When we look at the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, we, the scholars have subdivided them into different categories. The first part is those actions which are part of the Prophet ﷺ's nature. They are part of his fitrah, his nature. The way that he acted, for example, it is narrated that when the Prophet ﷺ used to walk, when he wanted to turn, he would not, like we sometimes turn our heads and we turn our body. The Prophet ﷺ would not turn his head and his body, he would turn his whole body. Okay? So it is narrated when the Prophet ﷺ used to walk, he used to look like he is running. Or he used to look like he is walking down a hill, meaning he walked quite fast. Okay? This is something part of his nature. When he used to get angry, he used to go red. Okay? Now, do we say, Oh look, the Prophet ﷺ went red when he is angry, so if I am angry, I should try and make myself red? I am following the Sunnah of the Prophet? No! Okay? It means that these things were part of his nature. They have no legislative consequence in terms of recommendation or obligation for us. What they simply show, the minimum if some, the Prophet ﷺ did something, one of these things, is that it is permissible. So of course, the Prophet ﷺ walked fast, so for us it is permissible to walk fast. But to show that it is recommended, or more than permissible, we need another evidence. If there is no other evidence, it remains as permissible. Do you understand? Also, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, if he mentioned something, or he did something, and then he specifies something about that, then he could raise that hukam. So the Prophet ﷺ used to eat with the right hand. Okay? And one of the companions was going to eat with his left hand, and the Prophet ﷺ said, no, eat with the right hand. So now, there is a legislative impact. Okay? That it is recommended to eat with the right hand. Okay? Now, also, within this area, Okay, of the Prophet ﷺ as a man in terms of his natural attributes. There is also an area about the issues of technology, okay, things which require technical knowledge or specialization, engineering, computers, etc. The Prophet ﷺ has clearly stated that these matters, okay, in these matters, he has not come to tell us how to build a computer. He has not come to tell us how to make a car. He has not come for, for these things. He has come to show us the revelation of right and wrong, of good and bad, and how to organize our lives. But in the technological things, we are allowed to look into these things ourselves. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ said in a famous hadith, when the companions, the Ansar, the people of Medina, they used to do a practice. They used to cross-pollinate the date palm. You know in the date trees, the trees, to pollinate, to increase the yield, to increase, to get more dates. What they used to do, because you know how fruit grows, okay, that they need to be pollinated, like flowers. So they used to get one branch from one tree and hit it together with another tree. So the seeds from go one go into the other, okay, or the pollen from one, so it goes into the other and it becomes pollinated and the yield will increase. So the, he thought the Ansar, they were doing this thing. And he thought, he did not understand what they were doing in the reality. So he told them, why are you doing this? They understood from his words that he may be meant that it was haram. So he stopped, they stopped doing that. The next year, the date yield had decreased in Medina. Meaning the amount of dates in the marketplace, they went down. And they came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked them, why is this? And they said, well, you told us not to do this. And he said, no, no, I did not mean that. He said in a famous hadith, you are more knowledgeable in your affairs of your dunya. Meaning the affairs of 
these technological things, you are more knowledgeable in those things. If you are an expert in medicine, you know about that. If you are an expert in technology, you know about that. Okay? Meaning, he did not mean it is prohibited here. He was simply asking what they were doing. In another example, when the Sahaba, their mentality is that they were careful to understand which issue is from strategy or technology and which issue is revelation in the sense of a fard or haram or makru or Okay? So as an example, in the Battle of Badr, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, maybe we should do this in the battle, the companions, they ask him, is this from revelation from Allah or is it a matter, matter of opinion, war and strategy? Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, it is a question of opinion, war and strategy. Meaning what? It was not directly revealed from Allah that we have to fight the war in this way. It is an area which is optional. Meaning permissible. So, then Habbad bin Mundir suggested maybe we should take the wells of Badr and so on. And the Prophet ﷺ followed his suggestion. Okay, so we understand that when it comes to these matters, we have to look. We cannot say automatically that, oh, the Prophet ﷺ did not drive in a car, so therefore it is haram to drive in a car. That is not true. The Prophet ﷺ has shown us that it is permissible to travel. And Islam, from the general evidences, has allowed us the things, unless there is a prohibited type of thing. There is a principle in the science of jurisprudence, Al-Asal fil Ashya al the principle related to things, meaning material objects, is that in origin they are permitted because Allah has created the world for our utilization. Apart from a very sh- short list of prohibited things, we're not talking about action, things like pork, like dead meat, like alcohol, we cannot use those things. But when it comes to any other thing, we can use that. The Prophet used to send the Sahaba to Yemen to learn the art of making swords. In the Battle of Khandak, he used the trench which was from the Persians. In fact, it is narrated in authentic hadith. The Prophet said, I love the clothes from Asham. And Asham at that time was part of the Roman Empire. They were not Muslims. Okay, he liked the clothes which were from Syria, Jordan and Palestine, this area. So we must understand that when the Prophet did, which cat- did something, which category does it fall under? The second category within his actions, is those actions limited specifically to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning they were restricted only for him, we cannot do them. And if we do them, we are sinful. I mentioned some of them earlier, okay, that the Prophet ﷺ, for example, for him to hajjud, was farm, an obligation, but we do not do it with the intention of farm. Okay, we do it with the intention of recommendation. For the Prophet, he had to pray every single day. He could not miss it. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ was allowed to marry more than four wives at one time. We cannot do that. Allah has told us in the Quran, marry once, twice, thrice or four times. That's it. At one time. The Prophet ﷺ, at one time he had nine wives. Okay? So, or more than four. So it is not permissible for us to have more than four. This is an action what is known as khas, specific for the Prophet ﷺ, restricted for him. Okay? Not for us. For example, another example, in the marriage, his marriage uh, to Zainab bin Sajahash, okay, radiallahu anha, he's married to Zainab, that marriage, was that contract was performed by Allah, and the witnesses were the angels. The Prophet ﷺ, he walked into the house of Zainab without a mahram, without her having a mahram. And he said, Allah has married me to you. Okay? That is why Aisha radiallahu anha and the other wives of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to say that Zainab used to be very proud of that. She used to say that Allah has been the one who performed my contract of nikah, of marriage. Okay? Because it is mentioned in the Quran that Allah is the one who married. Okay? And we know that the Prophet ﷺ, has told us that explicitly. So, this of course is something specific to him. We cannot walk to Omar and say, Allah has married me to you. <laughs> okay? That is a specific thing. To him, we cannot do that. Right? That you have to have the contract of witnesses and so on, Wali Amar, so on. Okay? So, this is what we know the specific things for the Prophet. ﷺ. So, not automatically, just because the Prophet does something, it is not automatic for us. 
The third thing, this is the most important category, the actions of the Prophet ﷺ which carry a legislative impact, which carry a direct hukum shari for us. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, pray as you see me pray. So when we pray, we, we follow the Prophet ﷺ. Also, he said, emulate me in your rituals. Okay? So, when we perform Hajj, we look at the Prophet ﷺ, how he performed it. This is a legislative impact, meaning when the Prophet ﷺ was doing a fard or a recommended thing, the way that he did it, the way he performed it, becomes for us the methodology of how to achieve that. Okay? So the way the Prophet ﷺ performed Hajj becomes the methodology for us to perform Hajj. Because Allah has told us to follow Him, and it is known as Sa'asi emulation in the actions of the Messenger. So, if the Prophet ﷺ was doing something as a fard, like Hajj, we know already this fard from the Kitab, from other evidences. So, if the Prophet ﷺ made tawaf a specific number of times, then we'll take that as an evidence. That this is the number of times he made tawaf. If he made from Safa to Marwa, he ran. This is the number of times he ran. Similarly, in any fard that the Prophet ﷺ did, if he does a fard, the way that he did the fard, if it is repeated, if it is by repetition, the way he undertook that fart becomes fart in itself. Unless there is an evidence that is restricted to him only. For example, for Salatul Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ used to always read two surahs. Okay? Most of the time. Now, now and again, the Prophet ﷺ used to read another surah or different surah. And the Sahaba, they asked him, O Messenger of Allah, why do you change? He said, because if I continued, you would take it as a fart. Do we understand? That if the Prophet ﷺ was undertaking a fart in a particular way, in the same way, the same way, for us it becomes fart the way to achieve that. So if the Prophet ﷺ always prays salah in the same way, in terms of the tarsib, the ordering, that is definitely the ordering of prayer. Okay? You understand? We cannot say, I will make sujood first, then qiyam, then ruku, and mix it up. Okay? That is definitely the ordering of prayer. No scholar ever disputes that. The scholars may debate on the details, put your hand here or here. That is a different matter, because there are very varying narrations about the Prophet's actions in that area. But in this area, the ordering of prayer it is definitive. Similarly now, the way the Prophet engaged in ruling, Okay, it becomes obligatory for us as Muslims to follow the way that he ruled because ruling is already a part. Allah said, وَعَلِحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنْزَرَ اللَّهِ And rule the people by whatever Allah has revealed. So to rule in Islam, to run a government, is an obligation, is a part. According to the laws of Allah. So the way the Prophet ﷺ ran the government in Medina as the head of state, it becomes obligatory for an Islamic state today, of course, today that one does not exist. But when it returns to follow the same method of government, the same system of government that the Prophet ﷺ had, for example, some, try, some people try to say, no, the Prophet ﷺ did not have a form of government. That is nonsense. That contradicts all the books of Hadith and the books. Look at, if you look at Sahih Muslim, okay, you can go and find it if you, maybe you have it here. Look in there, there is a book, Kitab al-Imara, the book of ruling. You can open it in the chapters, the Kitab al-Iman, the Book of Iman, okay, and then the different things. In there, there's the Kitab al-Iman, the Book of Ruling, it mentions the Hadith. If the Pledge of Allegiance is given to two rulers, two Khulafa, kill the latter of them, meaning it's putting a rule of government, that you must only have one ruler, one Khalifa. Okay, there's a Hadith in the, in the same uh, book, Sahih Muslim, that... The children of Israel, their politics, their siyasa was looked after by the Anbiya, the Prophet. When one of them died, they were succeeded by another one. But after me, la nabi ba'di, there is no Prophet after me. There will be khulafa and they will number many. And the Sahaba asked, what do you order us, O Messenger of Allah? He said, follow them, for Allah will question them. Give them the allegiance, give them the bayah. For Allah will question them for what they are responsible with. So we understand that in Islam, there is a method of government. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, just to give you some examples, he appointed 
معاذ بن جبل رضي الله عنه ابو موسى العشري علي بن ابي طالب as judges to go to Yemen Muad also as a governor as a wali he appointed okay other governors in different districts to rule over those areas on his behalf okay and he gave them advice he asked them what will you rule by when he said Muad in the famous hadith what will you rule by he said I will rule by the kitab of Allah and if you do not find the answer in there I will look to the sunnah of his messenger and if you do not find the answer in there he said I will make ijtihad I will derive from those two sources for the situation and the Prophet ﷺ commended him and said and called him the messenger of the messenger of Allah okay the Prophet ﷺ had assistance in government assistance you know like today you are president vice president it's something like that but different the Prophet ﷺ said my two wazir my two uh, wazir in the akhirah Okay, my assistants in the Akhirah are Mikail and Jibrail, the angels. My two wazirs in the dunya are Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr and Umar were the assistants of the Prophet ﷺ in government. Like you have something like a vice, vice president, but it's different because they have more powers. That they used to rule, they used to go around, they used to judge cases, they used to deal with issues. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ had governors, he had assistants, he had an army, he used to appoint the commanders of an army okay and he used to appoint a command structure we know in the battle he said okay that Jafar ibn Abi Talib should be the commander if he dies then this man if he dies then Abdullah ibn Ruwaha okay he, he gave a whole command structure and in fact in that battle everyone died which he mentioned so then the people erected in the army the commander which was Khalid bin Walid okay so he had an army which was a pillar of the state he had a Majlis Ashura. He had a council or consultative assembly. It is narrated in the books of Sira that he used to have seven from the Ansar and seven from the Mahajirin. And they mentioned their name. So he had a Majlis. Meaning today, he, today, if you have a head of state, a ruler who rules by Islam, he must have a Majlis who will ask them to advise. Not as a parliament where they vote about halal and haram, whether you are legalized prostitution or not. Okay, in Islam there is no parliament in that sense. There is a consultation, okay, because the legislation is already set by Allah and His Messenger. So He had these pillars of a state. So this is also from the Sunnah of the Messenger, okay, in terms of the way that He performed that. Similarly, the way He fought wars, the way the Prophet ﷺ fought a war, He used to, in an external, whether it was a defensive war or an offensive war, the Prophet ﷺ used to send letters to people and used to invite them to Islam first if they do not accept. They should pay the jizya, the tax, to live under the Islamic rule, and if they do not, he used to fight them, not to kill them, like today, they have their unjust wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to bombard the people, to kill the people, to kill 650,000 people in Iraq. That is not what the Prophet put for it. The fighting in Islam is to remove the authority, not to kill the people, to remove the... Because we believe that all the other authorities, apart from the authorities of Islam, authority of Islam, is unjust. Those who do not rule by whatever Allah has revealed, they are oppressors and tyrants and unjust people. So in Islam, the objective of war is to remove okay, the obstacles to the implementation of the law of Allah and to make the word of Allah the highest. That is the meaning. We also take that from the Sunnah. The, so we understand in Islam, the Sunnah is a legislative source. Okay? And we must take it in the correct manner, the way that the Prophet ﷺ engaged in da'wah. Okay? So people today, they will, they will say that yes, let us do da'wah like the Prophet ﷺ did da'wah. But, they do not study how the Prophet ﷺ did da'wah. Did the Prophet ﷺ do da'wah? Because we know uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla has obliged us, of course, in different uh, ayahs. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal muhidisul hasana and so on. Call to the way of your Lord with hikmah and uh, Mu'izzat al-Hasana, the magnetizing speech or the beautiful speech, and argue with them by what is best. Allah has ordered us with da'wah to call to Islam, but how do we call to it? Now, people will claim, yes, we should call to how the Prophet, in the same way as how the Prophet ﷺ did it. Yes, we should, because the da'wah is the first, and therefore the way the Prophet ﷺ did da'wah repeatedly becomes a part for us to emulate, isn't it? But did the Prophet ﷺ restrict his da'wah to ibadah, to morals, 
So only to believe in Allah in a secular way, meaning in a way which is detached from life. No. The Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, his da'wah was to the Iman, of course, to the belief against shirk, against the system of the times, the system of Jahiliya, okay, against the economic system, against the political system, against the government, against everything. So he did not just in Mecca, sometimes people give the impression that Prophet ﷺ, was only talking about, oh brother, become a Muslim, and these are the nice morals, and this is how we should pray. In fact, prayer and the details will reveal later on. The Prophet did not do that. The Prophet ﷺ was challenging the Quraysh. He invited them, come, okay, and he used to challenge them. And Allah Azawad challenged them in the Quran, and he used to recite them to their face. Tabbat yada Abi Lahabi Watab, perish the hands and the power of Abu Lahab. When was that? That was not revealed in Medina, that was revealed in Bakka. And who was that again? Abu Lahab who was the ruler of Medina. One of the main rulers. We know Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, Abu Sufyan, al walid ibn Mughayra. These were the main chieftains. And Abu Talib of course was also of, uh, one of the part of the leadership of the Quraysh. Okay? And the Prophet was condemning them in his prayer, in his recitation. It is narrated Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used to go outside his house and he used to recite the Quran openly. And people used to make trouble for him in that. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he went out to recite the Qur'an in front of everyone openly to challenge, because why did they feel threat? If somebody goes in the middle of the road here in Tughlaqabad and starts reciting the Qur'an, nothing will happen to you. Okay, it is, it is not about that. It is about what they were saying. What they were saying was challenging the system of the time. You understand that? The system was based on shirk and idolatry. And the whole system was corrupt. Why do the mutafifin don't cheat in the market? Don't bury your daughters alive. Okay? Ara'ita al-ladhi yukazibu bid-deen. Look at the one who turns away from the orphan, talking about Abu Sufyan, who was in power, who was a ruler. So we must understand that even in the da'wah to Islam, we must emulate the actions of the message. This is also from the sunnah. We cannot neglect that. Da'wah does not mean we talk about morals. And just how to go to the toilet, and how to do this du'a, and this du'a. Da'wah is greater than that. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ, what was his mission in Makkah? What was his da'wah for? His da'wah was to establish Islam. Not just to make people Muslims, they are two different things. Establishing Islam, and making people Muslim are two different things. He said, by Allah, when they came to compromise with him, they said, they went to Abu Talib, tell your nephew, we will give him everything. We will give him money. If he is ill, we will give him doctors. If he is you know, in need of women, we will give him all the women. Just tell him to quieten down this message. Okay? And he said, By Allah, if you put the shaf, the sun in my right hand, and the qabr, the moon in my left hand, I will not desist, I will not stop from this call until Allah establishes it. Or oh, I die in the pursuit of that. Okay? So he was trying to establish the Islamic authority, the state of Islam, the government, the ruling of Islam. So this is also from the Sunnah. So today when people talk about the Sunnah, they give a very distorted image. The Prophet ﷺ, we know he was, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily in the Messenger of Allah is the best example. So the Prophet ﷺ was the best husband. He said, he said in a hadith, the best of you is the best to his wife, and I am the best to my wife. He was the best husband. He was the best father to be emulated. Okay? He was the best dower carrier. He was the best carrier of the coal. He was the best ruler. He was the best commander in war. He was the best judge in the disputes of the people. Okay? He was the best friend because he was with his companion. So when we look at the Prophet ﷺ, do not become distorted in your view. We take one aspect. In ibadah we follow him and the rest of our lives we do not. So let us understand the sunnah in the proper way. And I will end with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said in the famous hadith, I have left with you two things. If you were to hold on to them, you will never go astray. But unfortunately in history, we have gone away from those things. He said, the book of Allah, the kitab of Allah and my sunnah. I call it all the
I know the subject, some aspects were somewhat detailed. You can uh, ask if you are unclear about any matter. You can discuss that. Feel free with us. Anything? Yes. Yes. 
Today, of course, their knowledge of Islam and the Prophet has predicted that. He has said in a hadith in narrated in Bukhari that a time will come uh, when the knowledge will decrease by the death of learned men, by the death of the people of knowledge. And at that time, okay, people will give fatawa, okay, they will give judgment, okay, like we see. Unfortunately, today, people see we have to understand what is the root for that. Many people today have a lack of knowledge and don't want to ask questions because they just follow, we will just follow our Imam. Our Imam said it's okay, Islam is Salah, we don't need to worry about these other things. In the Masjid, as an example. 
The Prophet warned us about that. He said that people will give fada from their from their mind. Okay? Uh, and you know, the, the Prophet warned us that that was a great thing. Also in another hadith, as you mentioned, uh, that the knowledge will decrease. He said that there will come a time when somebody will be a believer in the morning and a kafir in the evening. And a believer in the evening and kafir by the morning. And they will sell the deen for worldly goods. Okay? What is the meaning? How can you be a believer in the morning and a kafir by the evening and a believer at night? Meaning what? This is the reality, unfortunately, among some people today. That even the issues of Iman, not even the issues of the following the Sharia, not even on Iman. Because, for example, some Muslims, I read every day in the Times of India and all these newspapers, some Muslim women uh, and some Muslim men say, oh, the, the, the khimar, the head of the woman, no, it's not part of Islam, just says modesty. Islam, the Quran only says we should be modest. These are professors in the different universities. That is, to believe in that is kufr. If you believe in that, your iman has gone outside. You are not Muslim anymore. You see the problem? Because it is a definitive rule. It is like saying, I don't believe in salah. Yes, the issue of the veil, i.e. the face covering, there is difference of opinion in the scholars. But the khimar, the obligation of the headscarf and the jilbab, the outer garment, these are definitive things. People do not differ on them. So, we have to understand, people even lose their iman like that. Yeah? So, the issue is today that knowledge is decreased and the Prophet ﷺ told us, Badawul Islam Gharibal. When Islam came, it was something gharib, strange. It was something new, something different. Something that people think, oh, what is this? What the Yawdu Gharibal. And it will come back as something strange. Yeah. So, blessings to the stranger. So, what does this mean? This means today when we are talking to these people, they are saying, you are saying something strange. You are talking about Islam, that we should grow away of life, we should wear this, we should... They feel strange, but this is the way that Islam will come back. Yes, the time of knowledge disappearing has come, but also the time of Islam coming back has come. That we have to revive the deen. We cannot just sit and say, yes, the situation is bad. You are right that the situation is bad, that people don't have an understanding of Islam, but we have to understand the causes for that. We have to work to establish Islam and we have to work to propagate Islam in the society such that we build the Islamic concept. And in a comprehensive way, like for example in India, you take the example, they have secularized the deen. Okay, meaning what? They have separated deen and dunya altogether. So they say, what is deen? You ask somebody, what is deen? They will say, salah, tom, hajj, zakah, and that's it. And they will even understand those things in a very limited way. Okay? Yeah, just like Christianity. You know, it's, you know, it's just a moral to be nice. Now, if you ask them, what about the way you buy and sell and trade and work and in, in job? Well, no, that's nothing. What, what's that going to do with Islam? Ah, there's a problem. As we said here, that the sunnah is not only in salah, it is in all aspects of life, how we trade. The Prophet ﷺ was a trader also before. And how we trade, he told us the rules for trade. How we get married. Okay, how we deal with our parents, our children, each other in society, how we rule and govern, everything. So we need to portray the holistic picture of Islam. See, the, the, the deep people say, no, but the pillars of Islam, in Bunya al Islam al khamsa the pillars of Islam are five, yes. But the pillars without the building are useless. You understand, if you just have the five pillars of a building, of this building, only the pillars are there. Without the building, the pillars are useless, isn't it? The pillars are the foundation. On top of the pillars, there is a building, there is a house, there is a structure. So Islam is not only its pillars, those are the foundation. And even those pillars have been taken in the wrong way. For example, when we take the first pillar of Islam, the Shahada. How do people understand the Shahada? They understand it that there is no one to be worshipped except Allah. That is not true. La ilaha illallah does not only mean that there is no one to be worshipped in terms of the ritual worship. There is no ilah, meaning there is no God, no entity, no sovereign, no law, nothing. Okay? No God, nothing, except Allah. So this means what? Meaning that we believe also that Allah is sovereign. He is Al-Hakim, the one who makes the rules and laws for us in all life. So it is very important sometimes with these brothers, because I have discussed with many of them that try to restrict Islam to Salah. And they say, brother, Islam is about Iman and Salah. I say, okay, let us start from Iman. We don't even want to discuss the systems of... Let us start. How do you understand Iman? 
Is Iman only that Allah is Al Khalik but not Al Hakim? Okay? Allah Azza wa Jal, He has told us in the Quran so many times His different attributes. You cannot take one attribute and leave the other attribute. Okay? In Al Hukmu illa lillah yaqustu al Hakka wa huwa khayrul fasirin. Really, Allah is the one who is sovereign. He is the, the rule is only for Allah. And He declares the truth and He is the best of judgment. Yes. Yeah. But you believe in some part of the book, reject other parts. So we have to try and make them understand. It is our duty, you are right. To make them understand that Islam is a complete deen covering all aspects of life and covering what's happening in the world today. What's happening in the world today, like the Prophet said, that if you do not enjoy the good and forbid the evil, you do not, you know, work for Amal al-Ma'roof wa Nahir Munkar in joining the goodness, meaning what is from Islam, and turning away and telling people to turn away from what is evil, what is Munkar. Then Allah will send calamity upon calamity upon you. And you will raise your hands in dua, but He will not answer your prayer. So we have to appreciate that. <coughs> yes, brothers, any other questions they have? Uh, Why, uh, as uh, an elder concern, and he's the Imam of the whole Ummah in, in general. That's right. Uh, he's a person who is in charge of day to day viewing of the attitude of Ummah. In yes. So maybe the point you have given, uh, one of the such as the point he has been observing within and outside the company. So I think for you, uh, it's going to be the point of you to be discussed within day by day, inshallah, whenever you have time. And we do that for that. Yeah, and definitely. my question <laughs> is that uh, regarding the first verse of the brand, that uh, the first verse of, uh, you have mentioned that yes. man. Uh, and there is also hadith that uh, Prophet Muhammad said, A man has to man who has to be a man who has to be a man who All that Prophet Muhammad has, has obligated for us that it is, the, it, it is on the amount that we almost have to follow them. All these hadith will restrict some of the work of no, no, e- e- exactly. These ayat and those ahadith, like the Prophet Asam said, Kullu amalin laysa alayhi amruna fahurad. Anyone does an action not in accordance with our good, it is rejected. Now, these ahadith and ayat, they are establishing the sunnah as a source of sharia. That the Prophet, we must follow him as a source. But to get the ahkam, we must look at the hukum. Is it fard? Is it manzoof? Is it makhroof? Is it mubah? Is it haram? You see the point? So we should not take a misunderstanding when we say, take whatever the messenger wrote to you. It doesn't mean if the Prophet wrote on a camel, we have to ride on a camel. That's how people get misunderstanding. So they say, look, it says, take whatever the messenger. It means take the ahkam, the revelation. Because we have to take those ayah together with the correct meaning. The Prophet himself said to us, you know better in your affairs of your dunya, as an example. He told them, do not follow me if you know in the technological things, you can follow your own understanding. So the issue is that we, the scholars unanimously generally agree that the sunnah, the, these ayat and hadith establish the sunnah as a source of sharia. We must emulate the Prophet ﷺ in the correct hukam. It is still a source. So if the Prophet ﷺ rides on a camel, it's still a dalil for us, but it's a dalil of ibaha, of permissibility, not of recommendation or of obligation. We need another evidence to raise it to that. It's still a dalil. So it doesn't mean it's not from the wahi. It is still from the wahi, but what the wahi, even in the Quran, you have fat, you have haram, you have makru. Even in the Quran, Allah said, when you go hunting, uh, sorry, when you go to hajj, after hajj, go hunting. Now, here it's not saying it is fat to go for hunting. It is saying it is permissible now. After hajj, you can go to hunt. So it is a ibadah permissibility. So this is what we must understand. The people today follow Islam in general terms and talk about, even our brothers who talk about Salah, they talk about following the Sunnah in general terms, not following the Ahkam. This is a big problem. For example, my wife recently, she was invited to these gatherings where they talk about Salah all day and night, right? In those gatherings, the women who were giving the halakha, the women who were giving the, whatever the dars or whatever they were reading, my wife saw them afterwards, they were going outside the house at night without the khimar. Wearing dubatta, what do you mean in Indian uh, custom? Just uh, the, like Benazir Bhutto used to wear, you know, the, the scarf and tibia. My wife said to them, what is this? They were trying to teach Islam, but they don't know the ahkam, but they say, we must follow the sunnah, we must follow our Islam. Exactly. 
They do not know. They, they do not know the Sharia rules. They follow Islam is morality. Be good to your neighbor. Be nice. Be merciful. <coughs> as general things. Not in a detailed way. So we must follow every, in Islam there is a principle, every action requires a hukum. And every hukum requires a dhari. So any action you want to do, the Prophet ﷺ said in the famous hadith, Al-halal bayin wal haram bayin. The halal is clear and the haram is clear. In between them it is mutashabiha. Mutashabiha is a rough translation of that means grey areas. Or the unknown areas, things which are unknown. Things which are not clear. Then the Prophet ﷺ, if you read the hadith carefully, the Prophet ﷺ said, Some people are aware about them. Some people are aware about them. Okay? And then he continued, But if you were to fall into them, you have committed haram. And every king has a hima, has a protected area. And the hima of Allah is his prohibition. So here the hadith, let us understand it more detail. The hadith has different meanings in different contexts, but the, one of the main meanings is that the halal is clear, the haram is clear. There are some areas where you're not sure about. But the hadith says some people are aware of them. Meaning what? That if you do not know about the hukum, you are not sure, then do not do something because you will commit haram by doing that. You understand? If you are not sure, if you are about to engage in a contract, okay, and you are not sure if it's halal or not, like for example, you are about to work in a shop, but in the shop you have to put, uh, you have to deal with haram meat. Okay? You are not sure. Then for you to do it, you have committed haram. You must find out from the people who, who know, because the Prophet said, some people are aware, meaning the ulama, the people of knowledge. You ask them, like Allah said, ask those who, you do, if you do not know, ask. So we must ask to find out the hukam. So in Islam, our entire lives, must be governed by the Sharia. Whether it is personal, social, economic, political, everything. I will give you a simple example. Today people are not conscious about many things. Like, in India it's a very common thing, you have a servant who come and clean the house. Okay? And normally those servants are women. So in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ said, if two of you are alone, the third is shaitan. About the woman who is not mahram, who is not your wife. So for example, I have seen in many sometimes, in brother's house, I go there, and there is a cleaner, and he is alone in the house. So we have to, you know, I, I you know, mention it to them and explain to them that it's not allowed. When that happens, you should maybe go outside the house or pull some. You understand? Yes. People are not conscious of the Sharia. So we have to be conscious of the rules of Sharia. Otherwise, how can we ever attain Jannah? And some other people are yes. thinking it's difficult that. Uh, as a part of the whole of Rasulullah as it is derived from the Holy Quran that we know the whole of Some people are thinking it's difficult. I think it's a belief that fixing water and other food spending which is uh, not uh, a good manner. And uh, you have made mention that Prophet Muhammad has certain water while spending. Is there any hadith for that? Yes, yes, of course. There is hadith which is authentic about that. See, we have to understand this is the reason why people look at the Sharia in general terms, not in what is the hukum of the Sharia. The scholars have not said drinking water standing is haram. Some have said it is makruh because the Prophet, uh, you know, uh, it, they, they extract that. He recommended sitting down and drinking it, etc. So there is difference of opinion in that point. But he has not made it prohibited. So some people, they look at Islam in very general terms. So they, even this ayah, they misquote it. The ayah said he is best in akhlaq. But akhlaq is not the whole of Islam. In fact, the books of fiqh, the books of jurisprudence, they will have very detailed rules about economics and contracts, and about the rules of marriage and divorce, and the rules of government, and the rules of foreign policy and war. But they do not have, if you look at the books of fiqh, they do not have a detailed book or rule of akhlaq. Akhlaq or general characteristics which are good to be, to have. It is a personal thing. So akhlaq is only one aspect of the sharia, not the whole of the sharia. He is the best in akhlaq and he is uswatun hasana in all other aspects. People take akhlaq, so what they do, they are very careful in being very nice, very moral, but at the same time they have riba. You see the problem? Yes, you can leave, no problem. So can you see there is a contradiction? They take Islam as akhlaq. Islam is not akhlaq. Akhlaq is one aspect of Islam. You could be the most moral, I will tell you now. You can be the most 
moral of people, meaning you are the most nicest, you are the most merciful, you are the most forgiving, you are the best in your individual morality. But, if you engage in riba, all of your deeds are deleted. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ has said, narrated in Mishkat al the one who engages in riba, it has 70 grades of sin. The least of which, you understand, the, the riba, meaning usually, meaning taking a loan or interest or giving a loan or interest. The least of which, there's 70 grades of sin, the least of which, and he talks about the one who takes one dirham in riba, one dirham, dirham is an amount of gold, a small amount, not so much. One dirham of riba, 70 grades, the least of which is worse than having intercourse with your mother in the precincts of the Kaaba. This is the hadith in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see the point now? It is a kabira sin, it is one of the great sins in Islam. Allah said, He declares a war. Allah and His Messenger have declared war against those who engage in riba. It is narrated in hadith, on Yom al Qiyamah, the people who engage in riba, they will be given swords by the Malaika, they will be given swords. And because Allah has said, He has declared war on them, and they will take the swords and slit their own swords. Okay? You see the point here, Islam is not only akhlaq, Islam is mu'amala. Let us categorize Islam. Islam has different categorization in the rules. The ibadat, the ibadat or the direct relationship with Allah, like the salah, the song, da'awah, jihad, all of these are from the ibadat rules. Okay? The, the rules which you do only as a direct worship to Allah. There is no other benefit in them, there is no other thing that you gain in them. Okay? There is no other result you are seeking. That is ibadah. Then there is the mu'amalat, the mu'amalat and the ukubat, the punishment, the transactions and the punishment. In the mu'amalat, you are allowed to seek benefit for yourself, but you have to do according to the sharia rules. For example, in marriage, of course marriage will benefit you, you will have you know, relations with your wife. In trade, you are going to earn money, but they must be in line with the sharia. But you are, they are different to the ibadah. In ibadah, you cannot pray to earn money, that is haram. But you can have a business to earn money, that is okay. So there is the mu'amala, the ukuba, ukuba of punishment, the punishment rules, if you somebody steals, cut off their hand, if they steal over the amount which is prescribed, etc. Then, there is the ukuba, the food stuff, and the clothing, and like men cannot wear silk, they cannot wear gold, etc. Women they have to cover everything apart from the face and the hands, etc. Then, the akhlaq. What people have done, they have made akhlaq and put that as the biggest thing and that is the only thing they call for. That destroys the nature of Islam, whoever does that. To call for akhlaq alone in society is haram. You have to call for akhlaq together with all the other rules. Yeah? So we have to be very careful. Wa alaikum salam. about what is going on in Pakistan. Yes, the graduation. About the race? Yes. yes. Now the system has made two issues. So we discussed the majority and minority are fighting each other. Yes. About the race. The majority that is pro Mushara. Yes. Right, yes. Said that we should abandon the outdated law. Yes. To which the active, uh, the victim wants to see forward witnesses. Forward witnesses. Yes. 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 Yeah. If she did it, she must be scared. They say we should leave that out just yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know that I have been following that. Now, what they say? In Shokat and this is what I say. Financial. Yeah, financial. We should abandon that out there. Because we need to give cover to person. Yeah. Now the accused must undergo DNA. If they are supposed to be guilty, they will be fine. What do you think? Okay. We have to understand, first of all, Pakistan, like every other single government in the Muslim world today, does not rule by Islam and the, the government does not care about Islam. Okay? We know they betrayed the Muslims of Afghanistan, they are they providing the air bases for the Americans and you know everything for the Americans to kill the Muslims of Afghanistan, which is not allowed. So, what, they don't care about Sharia, but they care about public opinion. Okay? So, in like in Pakistan, like in Saudi, like in Sudan, like in Nigeria, you have some parts of the Sharia implemented. But even then, we have to understand something. Look, 
if the basis of the system is not Islam, then you will have some, like, let me give you an example. Can you have a car without an engine? You have the steering wheel, you have the gearbox, you have the exhaust pipe, but with no engine. The car will not drive. Meaning the system, if the system of Islam is not complete, the system will not work. Okay? You will find that you will be messed up. So that is the reality in all these countries today. That the system is not Islamic, that is what they are referring to the verse you quoted. Do you take some part of the book, the kitab, and reject other parts? This is what they are doing. So let us look. In Pakistan, already the existing so-called Hudud laws are not the full implementation of the Islamic punishment and judicial system anyway. That is why there is a problem. Let me explain to you. Even in Saudi Arabia, do you think they implement the Islamic punishment system equally and properly? No. In Saudi Arabia, if the royal family or if the army steal, their hand is not cut. The Prophet ﷺ said, if Fatima stole, I would cut her hand. You don't do that. There is no bias in that. Let us look in Pakistan. Let us take the example of rape. In Islam, see, unfortunately, because the, the, the people who are in the power there, and even the so-called Islamic parties, most of them, they have very limited understanding of the Islamic legislation in these areas. Let us look. Rape is different to zina. The ahkam of rape or different to the ahkam of zina. Zina is consensual. The man and the woman together consenting with each other have intercourse. In that you must have four witnesses. Okay? And if you accuse somebody of zina and if you do not bring four witnesses, you are lashed. That is the Islamic rule. Because zina is something consensual, okay? And that comes in the hudud law. If somebody is married and they commit zina, then they are killed. If they are not married, then they are lashed, okay? Now, the case of rape is not zina, in the normal sense. It is different. It is the forced intercourse. So it does not come under hudud, it comes under ta'zir. Okay? In Islam, hudud means those punishments specified by Allah, the evidences are specified by Allah, and the punishments are specified by Allah, and we cannot change that, we have no choice in that. The ta'zir is those laws which are sinful actions which Allah has left it to the khalifa, the head of state, to determine the punishment. So, the rape does not fall under the normal issue of zina because it's different. It falls under ta'zir. So, if it is proved with four witnesses, of course, if it is proved with four witnesses, then the man will be punished by the action of the woman. But in zina, the man and the woman are punished. You see the issue? So, it is, it is different. Also, if the woman, now, what they are implementing in Pakistan is not according to the Sharia anyway. So there is no need, there is a need for the change of the law to implement the Sharia, not to implement what Shokat Aziz is saying. What Shokat Aziz and what Musharraf are saying, even Musharraf has openly said that, they are saying, you know, we should not abandon those outdated laws, we should implement the modern laws from the West. That's what they are talking about, a civil law. We should abandon the Hudud implement the That is true for us. Basically, to believe in that is disbelief from Islam. Okay? That you cannot implement a law from man, from the mind, from the West, from philosophers, from the Kufar, from Parliament, majority, Islam does not decide those things. Islam has already set the law. So, in rape, what is the law in Islam? In rape, if the woman is raped, forcibly, of course, then the, the case must be studied. If there is evidence, like DNA evidence, and circumstantial evidence, in Ta'zir law, not in the Hudud, because first we have to classify where is the case. In Ta'zir law, four witnesses are not required. In Ta'zir law, one witness is enough. In Ta'zir law, even circumstantial evidence can be taken, like, like DNA, like all of those other things. So, but the punishment will be less. Okay? So, if there is evidence from DNA, for example, and a doctor has verified that she has been raped, and so on, or if there is witness, one witness for less than four, the woman, of course, is not punished. She is not punished at all. She is not accusing without evidence. She, is, she has got uh, certain evidences. The, the judge will look at that. And the man will be punished by imprisonment and lashing, not by, not by killing. Yeah? Uh, there is a great scholar, uh, his name is Abdurrahman al-Maliki. He, he has uh, written a book 
for Nizam al Mukubat al Islam, the, the punishment system in Islam. And he discussed all the different details of that, and in there he discusses the rules of rape, and he discusses that, and he says this is the punishment. Uh, Nizam al Mukubat, the punishment system. I have got it in uh, a draft translation in English from that, uh, which is a draft translation, but it is written in Arabic. Yeah, the scholar is in Muslim. It's a very good book. Yes, I can give I can give you the Arabic version of that if you want all the translation in English of that. It is very good. Yes. Yes. No problem. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. <coughs> we must understand there is a difference between. Saving your money in a bank and directly engaging in riba. They are two different things. Okay? That in Islam it is permitted to save your money with someone. Now, in a bank, you are saving your money there. Are you liable by the Sharia whether they are doing something with that money or so on? No, you are not liable if they are non Muslim. Okay? You are liable. Or you, your contract with them, or your saving with them. You cannot accept riba and you cannot pay riba. Or you cannot witness the action of riba and be a testament to that and sign for that. The Prophet said, the one who gives, the one who takes, the one who signs, the meaning the one who uh, writes, the one who witnesses, all of them are guilty. So in Islam, it is permitted to save money in a bank. Uh, I have a bank account. But you must tell them first to take, not to give you riba. Okay, so I requested in my bank, I don't want any interest, so they remove the interest. Now some banks do not accept that. They will just have it, like in India there are some old laws, so they don't allow you to remove the, the riba. They will just give you riba as an increment. Okay, but what you must do then is not touch that money. You leave that money in there because it's not yours. You cannot use it. So if you have like, uh, let's say 10,000 rupees and the, the rate of riba is... Uh, that is say 3% then it would increase or 6% it would increase by that percentage but you don't take the increase you only take the original so that is fine that is not haram because taking and giving is haram but not saving in a legitimate way yeah? but they are requiring that such money uh, is yours and you are living the money yes so that is that 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 in, in Islamic law <coughs> we don't look at the consequences of actions like that we don't look at logic let me give you the, log- let me give you the same logic in the, in the Prophet Asalam's time. The Prophet Asalam in Makkah was buying and selling from the Quraysh. They could have used that money to fight him. But he was still trading with them. So Islamic law is not based on month, uh, logic. It is based upon what is the book of Allah on that issue. For example, Ali radiallahu anhu said, if the Islamic law was logical, i.e. if it was based on the mind, would make the masa over the, uh, under the socks, not over the socks. He understand Mata, when you make wudu over the socks, okay, uh, when it is cold for example, you can wear socks, make Mata over that, you don't need to take off your socks, and that will be enough for wudu. The Ali said, if Islam was about logic, then you would make Mata under the socks, because of course under the socks will be dirty. Yeah. Not over, but Islam has that it is over. So the Islamic ahkam, we do not use logic in that, we just look simply what is the hukum of Allah. So in, in the issue of, for example, uh, the kuffar, they are not, we are not reliable for what they do. They have agreed to store our money and when we want to take the money out, we can take it at any time. Fine. We are liable for that. Okay. Umar radiallahu an, for example, the kuffar, uh, they, they sold uh, the meat of pig and they paid the jizya. Okay. And he accepted the jizya from them. So the kuffar, we are not liable in all those things with them. With Muslims we are. So we cannot save our money if the bank is 100% or if the bank is, if we know is owned by Muslims. So in the Muslim countries you should be careful. So you should store your money in a foreign bank, which is non Muslim. If it is Muslim, because the whole institution of the bank is prohibited. So Islam does not recognize it as a legal entity. But with the non Muslim we are not liable. So we, even though it is, it, it is not according to the Islamic law legal, but in Islamic rules, we treat them as if they are legal. Okay? That is how the Prophet and the companion have taught us. So even if you think of taking that money to give it away to needy people? No, no. no. It, is not, it is not allowed. There are some scholars who try to say that, but it is not permitted. Why? I will explain why. 
There are some scholars who say yes, you can give the money from riba to the build the toilet or to yeah. the sadaqa or something like that. It is not allowed. Why? Because it contradicts the entire concept of ownership in Islam. In origin, we know so many ayat and hadith have verified that Allah is the owner in origin. Allah owns everything. So there is the first principle of economics in Islam is all wealth belongs to Allah. We are only allowed to own wealth when He has consented for that. For example, if I steal your pen or if I steal your watch, okay, that watch is not mine. Allah has not consented for the transfer of ownership. And therefore I do not own it even though I possess it. So there is a difference between possession and ownership. I may physically possess it. If I have stolen this from my brother, I may physically possess it, but I do not own it. Therefore I cannot use it. I cannot drink from it, I cannot sell it, I cannot do anything with it, I cannot give it a salafah. It is not mine. The only thing I can do is give it back. Right? So same thing with any illegal earning, whether it is from bribery, whether it is from riba, the only thing you can do is give it back. It is not your money at all. Okay? So you can leave it in the bank if they don't want to take it, or you can take it out and give it back to them. As an example. If they accept that, or you can just tell them to cut it out. So, these are the options. We cannot use it because it is not ours. In the first place, Allah has not allowed us to possess it. Therefore, we cannot use it, we cannot uh, give it to Sadaqa. None of that has a meaning. Yes. One of my questions is that uh, in the Holy Quran, uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala had mentioned that during the time that Prophet uh, Lokuman was yes. advising his son that Wala uh, yes. to do this, to do And among the, uh, the advice, he said, what does that suffer to me? Because we have many mentioned that Prophet used to walk very fast. Yes. Walk fast. Do, not, do not walk with pride upon the earth. Okay? <coughs> we can translate it roughly as that, yes? Do not walk, walk in the, the, the translations of the Quran say, in a haughty manner or in a proud manner upon the earth. Yes? Mm-hmm. Now, so that is true. And then what translation is that? You should, you should be limiting, limiting your, the way you walk. Limiting? Yeah. What do you so mean? The of the yes. It means, I, what I was trying to understand is not like you shouldn't be walking very fast like that. I no, no, I think we have to look at the, from what I have seen in the books of Tafsir about that, is they say do not walk with arrogance. And you know the arrogant man, he's the one who runs around at the end. I am the one, it's an expression in the language, okay? Uh, I am the boss, you understand? With, you know, it's like that. You should work humbly, okay? Yeah. With humbleness, not with arrogance and pride. So that is the meaning here. It doesn't mean in terms of fast or slow. It means arrogant or with humbleness. So yes, in Islam, we are uh, uh, mentioned, it is mentioned in other texts also to, uh, to walk over. We should be humble in general. We should not be proud. Only in certain examples we are allowed. So there is one, one of the companions, his name is Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu. Yeah? Abu Dujana, he is known as the red banded warrior. In one of the battles, okay, uh, he was showing off, showing off, like as if it is from pride in front of the kuffar. He was taking his sword and doing all this maneuver, like somebody is doing martial arts like that. Right? He was showing off. And the Prophet looked at him and said, Allah does not like this type of action except in this circumstance. Okay? So meaning in war, then we are obliged, okay, to like, uh, to, to show fierceness and yes, I'm there like the master, like that, right? We have to show that because we want to make them scared. So in war it is something. But in general, we should not be like that. In general we are humble, we are. We don't try and show we are proud, we know everything. Yes, so this is the meaning from what I've read. We can check the books of Tafsir, what it means. And another hadith you brought that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sallu kama raitu muni utal. Yes. You should pray as the way you saw me praying. Yes. So what happens to the people who are now Shia? They are following Shia. They are saying there is no limit between the Zur and Asr. Yes. And there is no, the limit between Maghrib and Isha is that it doesn't come. You can pray at any, uh, just within, if you five minutes in Taban, you can just pray. Uh, not only the Shia, and maybe even, the, 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 even the Sunni, the even the the Sunni Ali. scholars say that. No, it is not only the Shia who say that. It is only it, even the Sunni scholars say that, like Shafi, that you can pray. Your prayer is valid until the next prayer, 
but there is a recommended time of prayer. Okay? So the recommended time of prayer is, for example, at Maghrib time, the recommended time is just after the, the sunset. Okay? That is the recommended time. Now, you can pray until the beginning of Isha time, Maghrib. Your prayer is valid. If you pray even according to the Sunni Madahir, some like Abu Hanifa say it is Makru. Some scholars say it is Makru. It is disliked to delay the prayer. But you can pray it is valid until the end of the beginning of the other prayer. However, it is valid. Now, the Shia, the problem with them in their uh, thinking is that they have a problem in accepting the Sunnah of the Prophet alone. They say the Sunnah is of the infallible. The Sunnah is not only of the Prophet the Sunnah is of all the 12 Imams. Okay? So this is the, the, what we know as the Isna Ashari Shia, the people who believe in the 12 Imams. So they will quote the statement of Jafar al-Sadiq or Muhammad, Muhammad al-Baqir or Hassan as Hadith. They will say Jafar al-Sadiq said that it is Dalil. For us, Jafar al-Sadiq is a great scholar. He was a teacher of Abu Hanifa. But his statement is not a Dalil. His statement is his opinion. It is not like the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was ma'atum. He is infallible. He could not make sin. But they believe that all the 12 imams, their 12 imams are infallible. This is, what, this is a sin. They have committed sin by that. Yeah? Uh, they are not the disbelievers, but they are sinful for that. Okay? They are like, within, we have to understand, between, within the Sunni and the Shia, they are deviant. Within both sides. There are some amongst the so-called Sunnis who go into Kufr, they are Kufar. Some amongst the Shia who are Kufar. There are some amongst the Sunnis who go into Bid'ah, innovation, they are sinful. There are some amongst the Shia who go into Bid'ah, innovation, they are sinful. There are some amongst the Sunnis who are good, there are some amongst the Shia who are good. So let us classify, right? Within the Sunnis, for example, those people who believe uh, that like Sukkot Aziz, maybe he is Sunni, and he says, yes, I, we do, this Islamic law is backwards. Then that is, you become captured like that. Yeah. yeah? Then, that, then that you go outside of Islam. Similarly, there are those people within the Shia who go outside and say Ali is God or Ali is the Prophet, something like that. They go into Kufr. Or in India, there was a Sunni man, so called Sunni, Ghulam Ahmad Mirza Qadian, who formed his own deen, you know, Qadianism. They have a big mosque somewhere near here. Yeah, temple, right. sorry, you call it temple, not mosque. Near Batra. Near Batra So they are from the Sunni, not from the Shia. Okay? So they are both, uh, they are amongst them kuffar. Then they are amongst them uh, uh, the sinful, bid'ah people. Amongst the Sunnis, if you go to Nizamuddin, you go deep into Nizamuddin to the Darga, what they call. Yeah. You see people Great. making tawaf around the grave, going all of that, bowing to the grave, going, you know, jumping up and down, doing all sorts of things. These people are in bid'ah, so they are Muslim, but they are sinful. Similarly, amongst the Shia, you go to the, the grave of Imam Marhadi or someone, they do the same thing. They are doing all the same. Going, they are people of Bida. Some people in the Sunni, they will say, my scholar, he is a peer. A peer means, uh, you know, he is uh, like infallible. He gets wahi from Allah. Not directly, they will not say wali wahi. Ilham, he gets inspiration. He has a dream and every dream he has is true and everything is true, whatever he says. And he told me this and he told me that and it's true. Even if it contradicts the Sharia sometimes. So these are the people of Bida. Similarly in the Shia, they have this thing. So, Amongst both, we should not discriminate and say only the Shia, all of them are wrong. Among the, then in, within the Shia, you have people like uh, the Zaydis. Mm-hmm. The Zaydis are very good. The Zaydis Zay- are uh, the same as we sometimes call them the fifth madhab of the Sunnis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or the sixth, like after the Zahiris. The Zaydis are like Imam al-Shawkani. He was Zaydi. They don't believe in infallibility. They say no, the infallibility uh, is not there. It's only for the Prophet. They don't accept the infallibility. They accept the same as what we accept. The only difference they have is they say, in their personal opinion, but they do not criticize the Sahab or anything. They say it would have been better if Ali was the Khalifa after the Prophet. But there is nothing else they say. They accept Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and everyone, they have no problem. Yeah? So, we must be uh, correct when we talk about the Shia. We should not discriminate totally against them. So all of uh, like Shokani and all of, all of these people, on that six months, yeah, yeah, they fall all on that the agreement that you can pray without uh, limit. It's not, it's not no, we have to look at the books of fiqh, yani. uh, as I said already, even the Sunni Imams accept that you can pray, but it is makroo, 
Maybe the Shia say it is not makruh. I don't know. I have to look at what they say. How they justify that. Yeah. But we have to look at their books. It's like Shokani, he is a great scholar. People refer to him. And he, when they made Ishtihad, he was a Mujtahid. He made Ishtihad based upon the He would not just invent something. He was very strict in his uh, evidences and his books are known as the, some of the master works like Nadul Otar is a very famous work uh, of his or Irshad al which is a book of Sunni. He has written in detail and everyone accepts him, all the Sunni scholars accept him. Yeah? Yes. Maybe we will end uh, because time is 7.30? Okay, we have a few minutes if anyone has. Yes. Yes. You see, the issue is, yeah, if there is ikhtilaf in some areas of salah. Not only going of legs and shoulders, there is ikhtilaf in the style of prayer itself. Because there are differing narrations of how the Prophet prays. There is a narration that the Prophet Asana prayed like this, there is a narration that the Prophet Asana prayed like this. They are both authentic. Now, which one outweighs the other? This is why the scholars have debated okay, on this matter. So some say it is mubah to pray like this, but it is mandu recommended to pray like this. You see the issue, so there is debate amongst them. So like similarly, within the boiling of the, generally the three schools of thought, or most of the schools of thought, they accept that. Abu Hanifa says the joining of the shoulders, but not the joining of the feet. Yeah? And he will have some evidence for that. So, you know, there is differences on these types of evidence. So, so we have to... Whatever view we follow, we should be from the read and we should be from somebody who is accepted as a Muslim, as a jurist, who has derived that. So you can follow Imam Malik or uh, Abu Hanif or Shafi or any other scholar, even somebody who is a Muslim today, you can follow if he has his own uh, opinion, as long as it's based on evidence and as long as it's uh, expected. We accept all of them as valid opinions. Yeah? The strongest, evidence, uh, strongest opinion I follow personally is that it should be both, because it is from a narration. Uh, that the, the joining of the, the the shoulders and the feet. Yeah. So there is, we should not say those who do not do that they are committing.